Good morning. Today we continue with Metropolitan Community College's Hispanic Latino Heritage Month virtual programming. It is great to have you back during this busy fall quarter term. My name is Barbara Velasquez. The United States officially honors Hispanic Latino Heritage Month from September 15th through October 15th, recognizing and celebrating contributions of Hispanic and Latino champions who trace their roots to Spain, Mexico, Central America, South America, and the Spanish-speaking nations of the Caribbean. The timing is key starting on a date that marks the anniversary of independence of five Latin American countries. Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Mexico and Chile follow, celebrating their independence September 16th and 18th, respectively. The 2022 national theme for Hispanic Heritage Month is Unidos, Inclusivity for a Stronger Nation. Your microphones and chat with other audience members are turned off, but you may always contact the host. Send your questions at any time to moderator Barbara Velasquez. Watch the chat for a link to the online evaluation of today's program. With over 50 opportunities to participate this academic year, those who attend at least 20 programs and complete evaluations with your contact information will be recognized. Lilian Prado Carrillo, migrated to the United States from Guatemala when she was four years old. Raised solely by her father, Luis Prado, Lilian has always understood the importance of education. Her father taught her to have a strong work ethic and the power of education. Liliana attended a junior college where she funded her own education costs by working up to 50 hours per week and going to school part-time because of her immigration status. She later transferred to and graduated from Texas Women's University, where she received a full scholarship and quickly became an outstanding student leader and a campus motivator. In 2002, Lillian was one of 30 students nationwide awarded a congressional internship with the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute in Washington, DC. In 2013, she earned a master's in public administration from the University of North Texas. Since college, Lillian has served as an educator, a university administrator, and facilitator for national organizations such as Monster Worldwide and the National Council of La Raza, now Unidos US. In 2006, she was selected as a Sally May Funds national spokesperson and presented to 40,000 plus people about her personal journey and access to higher education. In 2007, Lillian decided to relocate back to Denton, Texas to marry Albert Carrillo, raise a family and give back to her home community. Today, Lillian works full-time at Alexander Elementary, a Title I school serving as a bilingual specialist. She recently received the Estrella de Tejas Award from the Hispanic Women's Network of Texas in San Antonio for her leadership and contributions to the community. In 2020, she was awarded the LULAC District 3 Woman of the Year Award for her work with Denton LULAC Council number 4366. In addition, she is also a consultant for Educational Achievement Services, Cool Speak Youth Engagement Company, and Lifelong Legacies, Inc., empowering students and families as a keynote speaker and workshop facilitator nationally. She is a wife and mom to five great kids and is a member of her local church, enjoys time with Bible study fellowship, and is involved in civic organizations such as LULAC, serving as past council president and HWNT, Hispanic Women's Network of Texas. Liliane is a recent alumni of the Latino Center for Leadership Development Fellowship Class of 2019. In August 2020, Liliane was diagnosed with breast cancer, but with the support of her family, friends, and physicians, she has since then gone into remission. She continues working, speaking, and advocating for underrepresented populations with respect and admiration for all. Please welcome Liliane Prado Carrillo, who will present My Father's Daughter. 
Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Velasquez, just for the invitation. Um, and so I, I'm excited about our time together. I hope that um, you guys will stick around and ask as many questions as you want. Um, and also just share parts of your story as well, if there's anything that connects um, with you or that speaks out to you. Um, I get the awesome privilege of working uh, for a company called CoolSpeak as well. And so CoolSpeak, what we do, it's a bunch of um, people who really just love uh, students, love the youth, love people. Uh, and we try to motivate, uh, share our stories, uh, really try to connect uh, and look at the person holistically to make sure that everybody, everyone knows that they have access to education, if that is what they are, desire. Um, and also absolutely that they are not alone, that we are a community and that we can um, work through everything and, and kind of just keep on going and, and stick together. So today um, we are celebrating just Hispanic Heritage Month, which is uh, an amazing time for us just to uh, really think about all of the contributions that the Latino community has provided to the United States and not just the United States, but worldwide, right? Um, as you can tell, I have my collection of books in the back. Um, I love to read. And so I have a bunch of recommendations for you all. Uh, but I want to I want to talk about those at the very end. I want to start by just sharing a little bit about myself um, and really why it is that I do the work that I do. Um, and I'm probably pretty certain that many of you are doing the work that you do because of something in your background, because someone first poured into you, um, because of the work that other people before you have done, and you consider and you know the value of that work, right, to developing students, if you're a student, to pursuing your education, um, if you're a parent, absolutely the same thing, right, trying to make sure that our students, our youth have as many opportunities, right, um, as we did or more so. And so I'm going to start off by sharing my screen um, and asking you all just a question. And you can kind of just tell me on a scale of one to 10, or you can use your fingers, or you can just kind of say like this, you know, that you too. Uh, but one of my first questions is, um, and I'll, I'll go back a little bit. One of the first questions is, do you believe that your voice has power? And so tell me on a scale of one to five, one being no, I, I really don't have, or maybe zero is like, I have no power, or five, what, on a scale of one to five, how many of you think that your voice has power? Let's see. You can, uh, I don't know, I don't think you're able to put it up in the chat, but if you're able to, then we would, I would love to see that. Okay, many different answers, very cool, thank you. Thank you. So uh, this is one of the questions that I ask a lot of our youth. And so when I go around the country and I talk to students, you know, about, um, obviously my story, but also just about them and who they see themselves as, their identity. A lot of them are first generation college bound students. A lot of them are um, first generation, even high school, potential high school graduates, right? And many of them will raise their hand and say, yes, my voice has power. But I think that's pretty much for the same reason that I raised my hand when I was a kid, right? So I was in a classroom probably about seventh grade and they said, hey, how many of you believe that your voice has power? Well, everyone else in the room raised their hand. So I was like, yeah, sure, my voice has power, right? Uh, but inside of me and inside my head, right? I, I call it this little voice that lives inside our head. I know that now it's more so, you know, it can be called the imposter syndrome or it can be something else, our insecurities, right? But inside my own head, I was like, absolutely, I don't have power. I don't have power to change my life. I don't have the power to change my family's life or their trajectory. I surely don't have the power to change society, right? Uh, or the state, the country, the world. It was just a very like overwhelming thing for, for you to ask someone. Um, and I think what I was looking at, I kept going back to the people that I learned about in history class, who were leaders, who were uh, the people that made, you know, these big differences that the books talk about, right? And what I realized is that no one in those textbooks ever really looked like me. Now, I grew up in Texas, uh, and so we can get all into like the legislature and who makes the decisions of what, you know, what is involved in our in our history and our teaks and our textbooks, all of those different things. Um, but but I believe that one of the main reasons, right, is is as a student, as a child, I didn't have lots of people that I could look up to that looked like me. I had lots of people pour into me, help me, lots of teachers care about me, right? But I couldn't see myself as a leader because I didn't have that example. Now, fast forward, you know, many years later, I started reading, you know, about Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, right? Which lead me, leads me into this next slide. There's a movie that came out a few years ago. I don't know if any of you saw it, but if you saw it, you can, you know, give me a thumbs up. If you haven't seen it, tell, give me a thumbs down so that I know who who's there, who's, talk, who's uh, talking. Um, 
And if you have not seen it, right, I think most of you might know who Cesar Chavez is. If you don't know who Cesar Chavez is, I highly recommend you to watch the movie as the beginning steps, right? Um, but you can also start looking uh, him up and, and the story and his life's work. But Cesar Chavez was a um, civil rights activist. He was, he co-founded the United Farm Workers Union, right, uh, in an effort to um, make it a more equitable, more of a level playing ground um, so that farm workers could have the rights that they needed, that they should have been guaranteed, right? And working in our fields, working in this country, lots of the protections that we wouldn't even think would have been a thing, right? Having um, sanitary restrooms to use, having clean water, uh, not spraying pesticides as agricultural workers are working, right? That was causing uh, cancer and, uh, you know, pregnancy abnormalities and things like that, right? So he he saw all this stuff happening. And so he started organizing. Alongside, there was a woman that worked with him. And I don't know if any of you guys know who she was, but if you do, I would be very uh, happy, right? Uh, was Dolores Huerta. And so Dolores Huerta, it was a civil rights activist as well. She co-founded the United Farm Workers Union with, along with Cesar Chavez, right? And everywhere I go in the country, I've been very fortunate. I've probably hit probably 45 of the 50 states. Almost everyone, at least one person in the room knows who Cesar is, but sometimes not even one person knows who the Lotus is. And I attribute that still to the inequities here in our country, where we look at men and we look at them as leaders. But then we have women who produce just as much work, who are advocating just as much, who are making just as much of a difference, but we yet don't call them leaders or we look at them as secondary, right, in that role. And so yesterday I was talking to a group of students in San Antonio, a whole bunch of young ladies, and I was trying to get them revved up and say, hey, you have just as much power, right, to contribute to our community and you have just as much right to be called a leader as the young man sitting next to you, right? And that is both us as women, that is our role, and also the young men that work with us, right, to, to give us that space, to help us uh, take ownership of that space. So as I started kind of just learning and, and learning about these two individuals, I came across this photo and I realized it kind of dawned on me, right? And I said, man, you know what? These are people just like you and me. These are people just like my grandma, my grandpa, my aunts, my uncles, right? My dad. These are people who cared enough about other people that they left their own um, uh, comforts, right? So that they could fight for and advocate for the rights of others. And that really spoke to me. I talk about Dolores a lot because I'm a huge fan of her. She's 93. She's still block walking. She's out there in, Cal you know, in California and she's still doing the work. She is a fireball, right? But she was a teacher. And she started doing this work, you know, to advocate for her students that she was teaching and their parents. Um, her mom was a business owner. She was a, a, a business owner. She had like a 60 room hotel that she owned. Uh, the dad, I believe, was one of the first people that was elected to the New Mexico legislature as a Latino. This was like back in the 30s. Right. And so here's a woman who who wanted and gave up so much of herself. Right. For the for the advocacy, for the empowerment, for the betterment right, of other people. And that's really what we're, this is all about. Your motto today, or your, your uh, kind of saying today that you're talking about, it's inclusivity, right? Inclusi inclusivity for a stronger nation. What do we talk about like that? We talk about inclusivity and, and tolerance, right? And, and knowing people, knowing their stories, not being afraid of the other because they're different from us, right? Uh, Brene Brown, I don't know if you guys have read her. I love her stuff, right? Uh, she's a researcher out of Houston. She's a, a phenomenal writer, great TED Talks, right? She has a, a saying in one of her books that she said, it's easy to hate people far away. It's easy to hate people and to not like people when they're far. And when we say, oh, you know, I, I don't know them. It's easy for someone in the U.S. to say, oh, these immigrants, you know, why do they come to this country and they do things the right way? Why can't they just do things the right way? Why don't they just get in line? Why don't they wait their turn like everyone else? Well, that's a little bit of, of ignorance because there is really no right way. There is no process for citizenship, right? If there's not someone here that already can sponsor you, there is no pathway to citizenship for many people that come you know, to the country because there is no other alternative back at home. Um, I was fortunate about four years ago when the first few caravans started coming over to go to Tijuana to interview some of the asylum seekers there. And the desperation that they shared was the same desperation that my dad felt when we first came to this country. There was nothing left in their countries for them. Uh, a family came with three small children. 
uh, by the time I met them, they were living in a warehouse in a tent, um, had nothing. The, the kids' backs um, had blisters because of the sun when they would walk during the day. So she would tell me that they would walk mostly at night, but it was still a very difficult thing. And, and the, the person that I was with, the journalist, asked the family, and I translated, why, did, why would you do this? Why would you bring your, your three kids on a 1,500-mile walk, right? And she looked at us and she said, because to leave them back at home was death, was certain death. And to come here is at least an opportunity. And I think that's what we need to look at whenever we're looking at the Latino population as a whole is so diverse. It's so rich, right? We have families that have been here for generations and generations and generations. We have families that will probably tell you, hey, we didn't cross the border. The border crossed us, right? And we know enough of history that we know that those things are true. Uh, books like um, A Different Mirror, that if you're a history buff, this is a great book to read that provides a different perspective, you know, of the one that sometimes we're taught in school, A People's History of the United States. You know, these are also great books that if we don't take the time to actually learn and look at different perspectives and meet people and talk to them and bring them close to us, right, so that we can learn where they're coming from. Remember what Brene Brown says, it's easy to hate people far away. Oh, I hate, you know, all those Democrats. They're all liberals. I hate all those Republicans. They're all horrible, right? We, it's easy, right? But if we bring people in, if we listen to the history, if we listen to their reasons, if we, if we look at them and we see that they are people just like us, it's, it's not so easy to hate. And that's when we can start building a more inclusive America. So let me go backtrack a little bit. Um, so a few years ago, um, I was working at the University of North Texas. I was a program administrator there and uh, for a tuition guarantee program. And I got really excited because I heard that Dolores Huerta was coming to town. And so I got really excited. I went back, you know, and, and I got my two tickets so that I could go hear her lecture. And I went home, you know, and I told my husband, I was like, all right, guess who's coming to town? And he was like, who? You know, he thought it was like Pitbull or something, like some crazy person, you know? I was like, no, it is Dolores Huerta. And he goes, who's that? And I'm like, oh my God, like, how do you not know? Like, how's this working, you know? And so I explained to him who she was. And he was like, oh, you know, that's really cool. You know, that's really cool, babe. Uh, who's the other ticket for? And I was like, don't worry, it's not for you. And he was like, oh, okay, you know, who? And he goes, no, but for real, who's the other ticket for? And I told him, I said, it's for Ayana. So Ayana at the time is my, Ayana is my daughter. Uh, at the time she was about five years old. And so Albert looked at me a little confused and he said, why are you going to take Ayana to go listen to a lecture, you know, of this lady? And I told him, I said, I know that she might not understand. She's only five, obviously. I said, but for me, it's important to raise my daughter with intentionality so that whenever she grows up, she knows that there are other women of color who have made huge impacts to this country, who have advocated for the life of other people, right? Uh, who have gone before and who have people have listened to. I mean, for her to, to uh, organize the 1968 grape boycott and thousands and thousands and thousands of people all around the United States to give up grapes, right? Um, for her to negotiate the contracts between the laborers and the farm owners, right? Uh, she's just like the matriarch to me of uh, Latino activism, right? And so I want my daughter to know about her, to, to one day that if Texas ever catches up, and actually puts our history the way it is in the textbooks that we teach our children, right, which I think we're a little far away from right now, uh, unfortunately, right, that Ayana might open a book one day and be like, hey, my mom took me to meet her. Hey, my mom, my mom, you know, talked about her all the time. And that she can one day know that she has the power, that there is power in her voice, right? So I went up to my daughter and I was like, babe, on Friday night, you're going to put your dress on. We're going to get all pretty. You know, we're going to have dinner and then we're going to go meet this amazing lady. She is beautiful. She's smart. You know, she's this, this is this. And she looked at me with her little face and she goes, is it Taylor Swift? And I'm like, no, it's not Taylor Swift, girl. You know, <laughs> like in her little five-year-old voice. And she goes, well, who is it, right? We finally get to the place. We get in line. Um, you know, she's trying to look, she finally sees Dolores, you know, she's short, she's a little bit older, and she looks at her and she goes, mom, she looks like my abuelita, and I'm like, girl, don't be talking about your abuelita, you know, that's not your abuelita, I was like, that's Dolores, right, uh, we get in line, I had bought this poster for my daughter when she was about one year old, and it says, viva la causa, and I explained to students everywhere, and to adults and everyone, viva la causa, it is long live your cause, and it can be whatever cause you want it to be, 
whatever you are passionate about, whatever you want to put your energy in, whatever you want to dedicate your time to, whatever you want to see change, that is your cause, right? So I bought it in hopes that one day my daughters will pick up a cause that they can fight for and that they can be passionate about, right? Uh, whether it's immigration, access to education, homelessness, food insecurities, mental health, whatever it is, right? So we take the poster, I show it to the Lotus, I introduce her to my daughter, and she very graciously signs the, the poster and she says, Si se puede to Ayana and Camila. Camila is my other daughter uh, from Dolores Huerta, right? And so then I explained to my daughter, si se puede. When Dolores was talking, she explained, everybody thinks that Cesar came up with that phrase. Everyone attributes it to him. But she'll explain like Cesar wasn't even in the room. And it's not a knock on Cesar, right? It, it's the lack of us assigning credit where credit is due. And it's to her, it's to the Lotus. Now, uh, the more and more I've gotten to talk to her, I've talked to her about three times, met her about three times. She's just such an insightful person. And the first thing that she'll tell us as a woman, right, is the only regret that she might have is to not assert her place in leadership roles earlier than she did. Because we are raised to kind of lower our head. We're raised to like not, you know, not be, you know, take up space and, you know. And so she, she talked about a, a moment where they negotiated these like big contracts and there was a chair where she was supposed to sit and she got up to like get some water or something. And it was her, it was Cesar and then like the owners of the farm. And uh, they were about to sign this contract. And then when she came back, someone was sitting in the chair and the person looked up at her and he goes, oh, is this your chair? And she said, oh, it was, but it's okay. So she kind of like backed off, right? So then when all the contracts are happening, they sign, she's signing, everybody signs, and then they snap a picture and she's not even in the picture, even though she was the one that negotiated that contract. So she said, I will never give up my chair again after that. That's what I learned. And I think that so much of, so many of us as women, right? We need to make sure that we are not giving up our chairs, that we are, are holding fast, that we are doing the work and that we are bringing other people alongside with us, right? But that we are passionate, uh, not because we want the credit, but because but because we want other young ladies, other young girls, other women to see that it is possible for us to have that leadership. So I tell you this whole long story because that is not at all the way that I was raised. Uh, so I was raised uh, very differently, right? Uh, not worse, not bad. I don't think I am very happy um, with, with the way that things happened and turned out in my life, because I think that's who's that, what's made me who I am, right? My dad always asked me, like, do you wish your life would have been different? And I always tell him no, because I, I think that we did the best with what we have. And that's all we, we all that we can ask for. Um, but I'm originally from uh, Guatemala. So this was me and I uh, share these pictures and, you know, I tell my dad, I'm like, dad, why'd you always have like a gorro on me? You know, like the little thing. And he's like, cause you were bald baby. And I was like, oh, girl. You know, I was like, well now you're bald. So, Hey, you know, uh, but I was raised there. I was born in 79. So I'm 42 and actually, actually I'm 43. Today's my birthday. So I'm 43. And, uh, my dad, you know, tells me these stories of like the country coming out of a civil war in Guatemala, uh, hundreds, 300,000 plus people, indigenous people, land stolen, murdered, right? Students, professors, anyone who questioned the government, you know, um, just killed, disappeared, all of this going on, on top of no work, no money, right? And so my dad uh, decided that he was going to come to the United States uh, and work and do as much as he could. He tells us stories or he tells me stories of, you know, when I was young, like not having enough food to eat or not having money for milk, uh, living in this like concrete little room that if you've been to Central America, you know how the houses are small, right? Um, and, and having to be awake because at night the rats could smell the milk and they would try to come and like gnaw, you know, on me if I was being taken care of. Just the poverty, right? And so he decided to come to this country. He worked really hard for about a year and a half. And then he went back for me, my mom, and my sister. Now, when we came, we came as a family of four. Uh, but what I always tell people is that even though people think that the trek coming over here from other countries is the hardest, it's not always the hardest. The hardest is once you get here because that's when depression sets in. That's when insecurity sets in. That's when not knowing the language. That's when not having the right documents, right? And start thinking like, man, did I do the right thing? Would it have been better for us to stay you know, in our country? because it's just a lot of unknowns, right? Um, my dad tells me stories. I was only five when we came. I was about four 
almost five when I, we came. And so crossing um, is something that my dad will tell me. He tells me, you know, that I was so little and my sister was so little and the river was so high that he had to put my sister on his shoulders. And then the coyote that was helping us had to put me on his shoulders. They threw a rope across the river and then they pulled. They had one person on the other side holding the rope. And so that the people that weren't strong swimmers and they couldn't swim could hold onto the rope so that the current wouldn't take them away. Right. I could, I could probably tell you story after story of the things that he shared, right? Coming to this country. And, and that desperation that I talked about, that family at the beginning, is the same one that my dad had. We came with the clothes on our back. We didn't have anything, right? But to come to this country is to have an opportunity. And to stay over there would have been almost certain death. Now, we finally got here. Like I said, we arrived as a family of four. Uh, but like I said, all that depression, all that anxiety, uh, things that we don't talk about in the Latino culture, especially in immigrants, right? My dad never said, I feel depressed. I feel sad, right? That came out in anger. That came out in, in drinking, right? And alcoholism and dependency, right? Um, all of that stuff came out in different ways, you know, for, for my parents. Um, and you know, I, I remember certain things. I don't remember lots of things, but I do remember there was a couple of times where, you know, my parents would fight, you know, or my mom would, um, you know, had her first job and she would tell me and my sister, you know, put on your coat, la chumpa, we call it a chumpa in Spanish, you know, in Guatemala, a jacket. And, uh, you know, she'd make us like walk outside to go make a phone call. And all I knew at the time was that the phone call was not to my dad, obviously. She was talking to someone else. Um, my dad, you know, every Friday would get his paycheck and go walk to the gas station, cash his paycheck, you know, pay the rent, pay whatever bill it had to do, and then buy a little six pack, buy a 12 pack, uh, you know, and just drink that whole weekend until it was time to go back to work the next Monday, right? My dad never missed work, but it was just like this constant like drinking, you know? And um, what I tell people is, look, I don't know. And as a child, it wasn't my job to understand, right? But all I know is that my mom um, started probably talking to someone else. And so I don't know if that was the reason that my dad started drinking and that's why he beat her, right? And, and fought with her. Or if, if he drank and he beat her and that's why she started talking to someone else, it really doesn't matter, right? But what I tell people is we have this cycle and inside this cycle is who? You, students, me children, right? And so, um, you know, life, life started out being really rocky. Those first few years in this country, I was a pretty happy kid, despite it all. I was the type of kid that I was in a in an ESL class, you know, my kindergarten and my first grade year, I remember I would go to the teachers and in my broken English, I would give them compliments and say like, oh, you're, you're pretty, you know, and like they give me a sticker, you know, and I'm like, score, you know, like put it in my pocket, you know, the next day I'd go to someone else and they'd be like, oh, you, you're nice, you know, and they'll give me a pencil and I'm like, score, you know, I'm like a little hustler from the time I was five, you know, <laughs> like saving up all my goodies, right? Um, and, you know, I just remember going home one day, I think I was in kindergarten and I get off the bus and I walk up the steps of, you know, this little Traila mobile home that we lived in. And my mom was there. And um, I just remember her, um, you know, getting ready for work. And so my dad takes her to work, you know, that particular day, um, my sister's nose starts bleeding right as she's getting out to go to work. And so she looks at my dad and she says, what do I do? Do I help you? You know, what do you, what que quiere que haga? you know? And my dad says, no, 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 go to work. I don't want you to get in trouble, go to work. Right. Cause we need the money. And so my mom walks into the restaurant where she worked. She had her uniform on and, um, uh, my dad takes me and my sister back home about four years, four hours later, he goes back for my mom and he waits and waits and waits and nobody comes out. And so he finally gets out. He's a little upset. He's been drinking. He knocks on the door. The manager comes out and she's like, what do you need? You know, my dad's like, I'm here to pick up, you know, my wife, Luna Stan, you know, mi esposa. and uh, the manager looks at my dad and he said, mm, she didn't work today. Like today's her day off. And so my dad gets really upset and he goes, I just dropped her off like four hours. And she goes, no, she didn't work today. So my dad goes back home, you know, and uh, my mom's already there when he gets there. And the first thing he does is he goes right up to her and he grabs her and he starts kind of shaking her. And as soon as he shakes her, he throws her on the couch. I'm in, in the same, you know, a, a, a mobile home is kind of like a big rectangle. So everything's like kind of right there. So I'm watching, right. As soon as that happened, my uncle runs out, grabs me 
takes me back to the back room, closes the door, puts on the TV, puts on the radio, right? And eventually I fall asleep. But I already know what's kind of happening in the next room. Because as a child, even though you're five, six, seven years old, if you've seen this, you know what's happening, right? Domestic violence has no, um, does not care who you are, how much money you have, what language you speak, like any of that, right? And so the next day I wake up, my dad's already at work because my dad, like I said, never missed work. 3.30 in the morning, he's awake in work by 4 a.m., right? He worked at a brick packing company. Um, and my mom gets up, you know, eventually makes breakfast, you know, uh, acts like nothing happened. Two weeks later, you know, the bruise has gone away. I come home from kindergarten again. She receives me, you know, at the door and she asks me, hey, do you want a snack? You know, um, I'm about to have to walk to the, to the gas station, but I'll be right back. And so I said, okay, she gives me a snack. She gives me a kiss on the cheek. And then she says, oh, she goes, Lillian, I need you to give this letter to your dad when he gets here. It's just a note. I'll be right back. I'll be right back. And she kisses me, you know, so she locks the door behind her. She gives me the note. She leaves. And when my dad gets home, my dad is uh, young at the time, right? But he is like this thin man. He had this big forearms, right? Because he worked at a brick packing company. And so he's dirty. He has a pañuelo on his head, you know, and kids used to say picture, see pictures and they'd be like, man, this, your dad was a gangster. And I'm like, nah, dude. That's what working people put on their heads so that the sweat doesn't mix with the sand and it burns your eyes, right? And so he comes in, he sits next to me and then he says, hey, where's your mom? And I said, oh, I said, she uh, went to the store, but she'll be right back. And he goes, okay. And then all of a sudden I, was, I remembered. I said, oh, dad, I said, she told me to give you this note. And so I give my dad the note, he opens it and it's this letter. And inside the letter, it basically said that she was leaving and that she wasn't coming back. Um, my dad looks at me, you know, with a completely different look in his eyes and um, almost like watery, you know, and he, and he tells me, Se fue. she left. And so I, I think at that moment, even though I was so young, I started kind of like becoming a little bit jaded and guarded, right? I didn't want um, you know, people to feel sorry. Um, I didn't want to burden my dad anymore as a five and six year old. I knew not to burden him anymore. And I knew I had to take care of him, right? Our children, right? When we go through so many of these traumas or aces, whatever you want to call them, um, have to grow up so fast. Right. And so all of this was happening the next day, my dad goes to school and he tells all the teachers, Oh, you know, her mom left. This is what's happening. Da, da, da. And all the teachers, you know, I could, I could see them. Oh, pobrecita, 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 her mom left, pobrecita, her dad's an alcoholic. Pobrecita means poor little girl, right? Poor thing. Ah, oh, pobrecita, they're undocumented. Pobrecita, they're poor. So many things that all of a sudden I'm like, I don't want to be viewed as pobrecita, you know? So I start kind of acting out. I start not paying attention so much um i start you know kind of being resentful to the the sympathy you know that people were showing uh and then when people started asking hey do you need something at home nope hey do you guys need food nope hey does your you know is your dad okay yep hey does your dad hit you nope you know like just started really like just being guarded you know being guarded and so all of this is happening in life my dad finally you know would every weekend would go back and try to find wherever she was at and it was a sad time uh, but it taught me a lot so my dad would put us in the car he'd drink as much as he could he'd put us in the car you know we'd start driving if you guys are familiar with Dallas you know we have 635 and these big bridges right and I just remember sometimes just kind of melting into the passenger side where you put your feet and just kind of like praying or asking or pleading, you know, with anyone that could hear that, like, we please don't fall off this bridge or that my dad, please don't, you know, fall asleep. Right. We finally get to a house where she was at, you know, he finally find her and then he'd get off, you know, stumbling and just start pounding on the door and say, Edna, Edna, abre la puerta, you know, open the door, open the door. And then he'd point your daughters are right there, you know? And so as a child, it wasn't just the abandonment that initial time, but it was the rejection every single time after that, that made me start thinking like, maybe I'm not worth something. Maybe something's wrong with me. Maybe it's, maybe I'm just like my dad. Maybe we're just, you know, something is just so bad in both of us, right? That she didn't want us. Um, my little sister was beside us the whole time until pretty much like a month later, my mom decided that she was, said she was going to come back. But before she came back, she was going to go back to Guatemala. And to prove that she was going to come back, and we're going to be together. She said to my dad, I'm going to take one of the girls with me and then we'll come back together. Well, when she went to Guatemala, what she did was she actually left my sister in Guatemala with my grandmother. And then she came back on her own to do her own life. And then she left me with my dad. So from the time I was five, it was literally just me and my dad. Um, 
the stories and the photos that I can share, you know, to me, um, it might have been from a teacher, from someone else looking into your life, right? Looking into my life, they would have kept saying that pobrecita or man, you know, but in the life that I had, yes, things were hard. My dad struggled with alcoholism until I was about 12 years old. Um, I tell people, I know there is no doubt in my mind that my dad loved me, but in his, um, in his alcoholism, in his own depression, in his own anxiety, right? Um, there were moments where he didn't take care of me. And those men that he called friends, you know, took advantage of me, um, you know, without blinking. Uh, and so I, I had a sort of resentment towards him, um, but he had no idea that these things were happening also because as a child, I knew that I wanted to prevent any more suffering to my dad. I didn't want to be that burden, right? Um, along with that, though, my aunts, my uncles, you know, they came in that helped teachers at school. I had a, a principal, you know, who looked at me and he said, have you ever been to summer camp? And I was like, summer camp, you know, like what, you know? And he's like, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a scholarship. My kids go to the summer camp and he paid for me to go to summer camp. My dad couldn't take off of work, you know? So he, I wasn't going to get to go. The secretary at my elementary school gave me a ride and took me to the summer camp, right? An uh, art teacher in fourth grade looked at me and she said, you know what? You're a good artist. I'm going to give you a scholarship. Do you know what a scholarship is? And I, I had no idea, right? She paid for these art lessons for like a summer. They were probably not not even super expensive. But from the time I was in fourth grade, I started thinking, oh, scholarships, like people could help you to go to college. Like maybe someday I could, you know, maybe do those different things. Right. Um, I had uh, teachers that would just call my dad and, and say, hey, parent teacher conference. So here comes my dad, you know, straight from work, dirty, you know, and just asking like, you know, how's my daughter, you know, in, in his broken English. And the teacher would ask me, you know, Lillian, can you translate and, you know, tell your dad, you know, you're doing very good. And so I look at my dad and I'd say, Papi, you sick, estoy muy bien, you know, and he's like, oh, okay, bueno, mija, you know, good job, good job. I'm like, I'm a Prado, like him, right? Like my mom's last name is Mejia. So if I messed up, he's like, Mejia, tenías que said, right? Um, and then the teacher would keep going like, oh, but tell him, you know, that Sometimes you talk too much, you know, and I ask you to not talk. And so I look at my dad and I'm like, uh, dice que hablo muy bien. Like I talk very well, you know, and I'm trying to like fix it, you know, in the translation. And my dad like bonks me on the head and he's like, hey, I know speaking very good English, but I understand. I'm like, oh, okay, sorry, my bad, you know. <laughs> uh, he was also the dad that like in the upper grades, right? He would always say like, hey, if you can get a 70, you can get an 80. If you can get an 80, you can shoot for that 90, you know, the 90, you can get a hundred, you know, and the one time that I would finally get a hundred, I'd come and be like, all excited, like, dad, dad, I got a hundred. And he'd look at me and he's like, why don't you do the bonus? And I'm like, like, dude doesn't even speak English. Like, how does he know about bonus points? Right. He was always involved. And what I tell educators, what I tell teachers and students and parents and everyone is my dad was the first one who didn't lower the expectations of the things that I could do because of my life circumstances. Right. And so many of us, even well-intentioned educators, we do that. Man, they're going through so much at home. You know, maybe a 70 is all you can do. You know, oh, you know, they're they're going through so much at home or, you know, they haven't eaten me. I'm just going to let them sleep another 30 minutes during my mini lesson. You know, and they're missing content, right? Where what we need to do is, hey, you haven't eaten. You're hungry. Okay, here's some, some water. Here's some crackers, babe. I'm going to read you the story and you're going to listen and you're going to retell it to me, right? I'm not letting you off the hook. I'm meeting you where you are, where your needs are, but I still have that high expectation. We need to do that for our students and our youth. We need to also take the burden off of parents and saying, you want your child to go to college? That's great. All you got to do is believe in them. All you got to do is, is tell them that they can plant that seed in their head early on, right? My dad had a sixth grade education, but from the time I was about probably fourth, fifth, sixth grade, he would tell me, you can go to college, but you have to go to school. You have to try hard. If the bus left me, you better believe I was on the phone with everybody that I knew and said, please give me a ride to school. Cause if my dad comes home and he finds me at home, it's over. Right. And if I couldn't find a ride, Hey, dodge patas in my, in my dodge, they said, dos patas, you know, two, two legs walking to school because I had the urgency from my father to say, education is what's going to get you out of here. Education is what's going to change your life, right? Um, so all of these different things were happening. And I can sit here, like I said, and tell you story after story after story. Now, life is difficult 
you know, and I'm not uh, trying to gloss over it. Like I said, there was many hardships in life, but I was so lucky that in elementary school, I had caring teachers. In middle school, I had uh, caring teachers. High school was harder, right? But I was in a program called Upward Bound, uh, which is a trio program. Woo woo, Cynthia said, yes, man, right? Uh, so Upward Bound, and they changed my life. I was very scared of my dad because of the discipline, um, but I only skipped school one time in high school. And you know where I went on the day that I skipped school? To Highland Hall at UNT, <laughs> to the upward bound office. So my friends are like, wait, wait, you skipped school to go to another school? <laughs> you know? And I was like, yeah, I guess I did. You know, But for me, because it, it was the staff there that were like family, they, they didn't give up on me. They knew where I was. They didn't make me feel shame for my insecurities and all of those different things. Those ladies there are still in my life today. And that was, man, 30, almost 30 years ago, 20 years ago, right? But that is what Upper Bound was able to do for me. So programs like Gear Up, like Avid, the work that we do, right, for students is so, so important. So all throughout high school, they were along with me. Now, I, I'll tell you, I started working when I was uh, probably about 11. I started cleaning houses, started cutting yard, yards with my dad when I was 12. My dad would work all week at the brick packing company. And then on the weekends, he'd cut yards. So I'd just go with him, right? I was getting money for myself so that I didn't have to burden my dad. By the time I was 15, I had a full-time job. By the time I was 16, I had uh, like a little full-time and a little part-time job where I would get 30 plus, you know, and then plus 15 hours. So in high school, even though I knew that I wanted to go to school, I had things against me. I didn't have the right status, right? Because my dad had gotten his residency through the amnesty in the 80s, but there wasn't enough money to submit my application. And for years after that, when my dad submitted my application, lawyers would take his money and they would never file mine. So the whole time I was from four years old to the time I was 21, I was undocumented. I knew what it felt like to see a police officer and lower your head because you don't want to make on eye, con eye contact, even though they're supposed to protect you. Like, I didn't feel that, right? I was scared. Um, I knew what it felt like when I was working at the grocery store and, and a cop came in. I had to, like, ask to go to the bathroom or something because I would be afraid because I was working with a fake social. But those are the things that I had to do. I had to pay the bills at my house so my dad could pay the rent. So he could send money back to Guatemala. I had to, you know, work so that I could buy the one pair of Nike shoes that I had for the year so I could play athletics and be like all my other friends, right? All of those different things. And so I remember high school, I wanted to go to college, but it was just such a far-fetched dream. It was so far away. It was like something that would never happen. And so I was just working, working. And I remember working and I would get off at one, two in the morning. And then so naturally in the morning, you know, before high school, I became truant because I was always late. I was always late going to school and nobody at school thought to ask, hey, why are you late? They just assumed that I didn't care about my education. They just assumed, you know, that, that that's who I was. And so rather than help, they said, you're going to go to court if you're late again. You're going to have to pay these, you know, fees if you're late again. And so as soon as they said that, all I thought was money. I'm like, that's the one thing I don't have. And I'm not going to make my dad go through that, right? And so I ended up dropping out of high school, my senior year, my first semester, and, um, you know, just working. Luckily for me, this family, their last name is Posey. I was a Prado. Um, their daughter was Heather, or like my dad called her Heather with a J, J-E-D-E-R, right? And uh, she found out, Penny found out through Heather and they came to me and they said, Lillian, you know, don't you want to go back to school? And I got kind of mad at Penny. And I said, you know, you have no idea what I'm going through. Like, you guys are rich. You have a nice home. Like, your, your life is perfect. Like, you guys have no idea. And she said, okay, okay. Um, let's go watch the volleyball game. They're your friends. They miss you. Like, let's go watch the game. We'll go have dinner. It'll be nice, you know? And so I'm like, okay. You know, so I go, I watch the game. And I remember at the game, we had made it to regionals. And I was so, you know, mad because my friends were missing digs and they were missing serves. And, you know, I'm trying to like make eye contact with the coach, like put me in coach, put me in, you know, but I wasn't, he was not able to put me in because I had already taken myself out. I had already quit. I had already just stopped. Right. And so after that game, Penny talked to me and she said, I, I want to help you. I want you to go back to school. She goes, can you quit one of the jobs? 
can, can your dad handle it for six months while you go back to school? Can you come live with me and I'll, I'll help you pass the classes. I'll help you make up the classes. I'll get you early to school. I'll pick you up late, you know, whatever you need. And I was so scared to make that decision. And I was so scared to leave my dad because of everything that we've gone through. But at that age, I think that was probably the, the, the first adult decision that I made where I said, I'm going to go with this family. And I'm going to accept the help. I'm going to let my walls down and just accept the help. And so for one semester, I went and I lived with them. It was the first time as a senior second semester, spring semester, my senior year, that I had someone in the morning there awake when I woke up, right? Because my dad had already been at work for two hours. It was the first time that a woman knelt down beside the bed that she let me sleep in, in the room, right? In the room that I took over um, and would just pray over me and tell me that I was special and that I was a, a young woman that had power and that I was beautiful. And I, you know, just pray over me, like things that I think a mom normally just does, right? Things that I do for my daughters, this person did for me, no blood relation, right? Not, she's not Hispanic. We're not even the same social class, nothing that unites us, but just her love. Like she was my guardian angel, right? And so she allowed me to stay in her home. I went back to school. I passed all my classes. I graduated on time with honors with my own class, thanks to her. After that, uh, Upward Bound took us to Washington, D.C. My dad was super excited. I became the first person in my entire family to graduate from high school. I went back and I moved back home. Uh, Upward Bound took us to Washington, D.C., and they gave us a tour of the Capitol, right? Um, I, you know, I, I realized there's so many young people, right, uh, in the Capitol, and they're so smart, and like, maybe I could have that life one day, right? And I reached over to my academic advisor in Upward Bound, and I said, Rhonda, um, I want to be an intern someday. And of course, she's like, oh, you can do anything, right? But still, remember that little voice inside your head that says, no, you can't. You can't be an intern. You cross the river on the shoulders of a coyote. Your dad doesn't even speak English. You guys don't even have documents. Said it at so many, right? That I was like, it's, it's a fantasy. I would love to, but I can't, right? But I went back to home. I was pumped. I went to a junior college first. I paid for my own education because I couldn't apply for FAFSA for financial aid or anything like that. I, I worked 50, 60 hours a week. I paid for my classes at night. I hired a lawyer myself. I paid all of the immigration uh, uh, fees that they had, even up to the expediting fees because they said that I was already going to age out. I was going to expire. See, those terms, people think they have no power, but they do. Terms like you're going to expire, you're illegal, you're an alien, you're undocumented, you're unlawful, right? All of those different terms, right? But I just tried to keep going. And my academic advisor, my upper bound family, they're right there with me. Penny was right there with me. And 10 days before I expired under immigration law, I got my residency. I got my green card for the first time. I was so excited. A friend told me about a scholarship at the university that was here. I went, I applied for, it was a grant for people that wanted to be bilingual teachers. They said, okay, you got it. We're going to pay for the next two, three years of your school, of your undergrad education. They paid for everything. And I remember walking out of the office, like what just happened, right? I just got this scholarship. They're going to pay for all my school, right? Up until that point, that university had been where my, my aunt, my tia, and my dad washed dishes and served other students. That was never a school for me, right? That was a, a school that had offices that in the summers, me and my dad would go clean because we needed extra money. And now I was going to be a full-time student. So I'm walking down the campus and I just kind of start crying, you know, just because it's overwhelming, right? Man, I get to school and I am asking everything. I want to be, uh, what, student senators? Yeah, I'll join SGA, uh, Bessel Bilingual Education Student Organization. Yep, I'm going to join that. Uh, Chi Epsilon Sigma National Latina Sorority. I'm not sorority girl, but I'll, yeah, Latina, I'll do that. That, you know, I'm looking at some advisors and people that are in offices and, you know, Patrick Vasquez, Vasquez, you speak Spanish. You know, how'd you get that job? What kind of degree do you have? Like, I am just trying to absorb everything until one fateful day, they invite me to a conference and it's called Tache, the Texas Association of Chicanos in Higher Education here in Texas. And this lady walks into the workshop and she uh, says, you know, I um, work with the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. We have an internship program and we are looking for, um, you know, the, the next generation of Latino leaders. And so my advisor is there, Lily, that's got you written all over it. You need to apply. You need to apply. And so I got my pen. I'm taking down notes. I'm like looking at deadlines, you know, and, and uh, she says one thing. She says we, we, we're looking for 30 students nationwide. 
And when she said that, she goes, oh, and including Puerto Rico and Guam. I was like, man, why you got to include Puerto Rico and Guam? Like, that's a lot of people, you know, <laughs> like, you know? And so she said that and I was like, nope, I put my pen down. I was like, no, that's not me. Like, I'm not that smart. Again, that imposter syndrome, that, that idea in your head that you're not good enough, right? And so lucky for me that I had mentors and teachers, people at that college, people at the university, right? That kept telling me, just do it do it, do it, you know? And so I applied and on the day that they're supposed to call me back, y'all give me a thumbs up if y'all think they called me, that they they selected me. See, none of y'all believe in me. That's not, that's not nice. Okay, there y'all go, there y'all go, <laughs> right? So on the day that they're supposed to call me back, I'm sitting by the phone. This is caller ID era, right? So I'm like looking, seeing if the phone rings, no one calls. And I am just so bummed, right? I'm so mad at my advisor. I'm like, I knew it. Like now, before I just suspected that I was dumb. Now it has been reinforced that I am dumb, right? Because I did not get this opportunity. I run outside. I tell my dad, I'm like, dad, I didn't get it. You know, he's happy because now I don't leave 1500 miles away, you know, from Texas. And uh, the next day I tell Gus, you know, I had already told one Thea and she told my cousins and my cousins told everybody else, you know, and so they're all, you know, making fun and stuff. And I just feel so small you know? And so the next day I'm back at home, I'm cleaning up, you know, I got some cumbia music in the back, you know, and all of a sudden the phone rings and it's area code 202. And as soon as the phone rings, I'm like catching my breath. I pick up the phone very calmly and I say, "Uh uh-huh, hello. Right. (laughs) And they're like, Hey, you know, we are, uh, this is Rocio with the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. Congratulations. You're one of our 30 interns. You know, sorry, we didn't call you yesterday. Uh, we were short staffed. You know, we already have your placement. You're going to work with Congressman Jean Green out of Houston. We already sent you your airplane ticket. We're going to give you a $2,000 stipend. You're going to live at George Washington University, you know, and all this stuff. <clears throat> and so I'm like, oh, you know, don't worry about it. Right. Like very calm. Like, don't worry. You know, I hang up the phone. I run outside. And I tell my dad, 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 I got it. Like they called me. He looks at me and he was like, oh, that's great. It's great. You know, and I was like, I'm going to Washington. And he's like, nos vamos, like him too. And I'm like, no, dad, you can't go. You know, (laughs) he tells you know, me like, I'll sell the trailer. And I'm like, no, don't sell our house, you know, but he was so excited. I remember that time he told everybody, all of his friends at work, that I was going to go work in the White House. Uh, and I was like, oh, it's the Capitol building. It's the other like white building, <laughs> right? <coughs> it wasn't, it wasn't uh, the White House, but it was just such a time of celebration. <coughs> oh, excuse me. The, the, the work that we did with the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, that's uh, my, the congressman right there in the middle. <clears throat> it was also Gasadilla, who's the advisor. He's the very one on the, on the far left. Dr. Rudy Rodriguez, who's sitting right next to me, um, and he is the one that wrote a grant of millions and millions of dollars uh, to provide students who would be bilingual educators in the state of Texas and who funded most of my education, right? And the other guy, I don't even know who that was. I'm like, get out of my picture, (laughs) right? I say all this because CHCI still is pushing the mission forward. They still have internships. They still have con- uh, internships. They still have scholarships, uh, fellowships, right? All over. They are pushing that mission over. And it doesn't have to be someone that is interested in politics. Like you are an educator, go work for educational policy. You are, have a love for healthcare. Absolutely. They need that too, right? Anything that you can think of, right? They have these agencies that are working and these people can help place you. I talk about this, but they also had a partnership with the uh, Asian Pacific Islander, you know, caucus. They also had a partnership with the Congressional Black Caucus, right? Working together, inclusivity, pushing each other forward, right? This is the month of Hispanic Heritage Month, right? It's October, September 15th through October 15th, celebrating the richness and the contributions of so many Latinos into this country, right? That we don't know about ourselves, that our students don't know enough themselves. When I went to Washington, D.C. for the internship, I realized it's not just the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. It's also the National Council of La Raza, which is now Unidos U.S. It's also LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens, who is 93 years old, the oldest civil rights organization for Latino people in this country, more than 90 years old. In Denton, our LULAC chapter is more than 40 years old, right? Um, Naleo, the National Association of Latino Elected Officials, HACUL, the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities, right? MALDEF, the Mexican American Legal Defense Education Fund. I was like, what? There are educated Latinos out there? 
you know, there are like, you know, just so many people making a difference that as a student in Denton, Texas, I thought I was alone. I thought we didn't have as many, you know, people. And so just getting the word out there, celebrating, recognizing, right? Reading, uh, learning, all of that is so important. After I came back from that internship, um, I applied for a, a summer um, study abroad program. They sent us to Mexico. We worked in Coahuila and in Saltillo, where I went and I taught children uh, in Coahuila, you know, just about education and the differences between the, ed the educational system in Mexico and in the U.S., right? Um, I came back. I became the first person in my family to graduate from college from Texas Women's University when I was uh, 23. Um, the whole time that I was there, it took me about five years from my undergrad, right, through community college and university. And I tell people all the time, my dad I did not pay for a single dollar of my education. And it wasn't because he didn't want to, it's because he couldn't. He was paying other stuff. He was paying for a rent. He was paying for food, right? I lived at home. Um, but it is possible with financial aid, with scholarships, with loans, as long as you're a smart loan uh, taker outer, you know, so if that's a word, right? They offer you 5,000, but you don't need 5,000. You only need a thousand. Go to the financial aid office. Tell them, can you decrease the loan? I only need a thousand, right? So that you're not taking out more than you need so that you don't have to pay that back. Um, my dad for my college graduation was so super proud. He made this big dinner. He invited all his friends, right? And I'm, you know, going around, everybody's congratulating, you know, and hugging me and stuff. And, and I look and my dad is serving the brisket plates to all his friends and family. And I look and I just thought to myself, like, this is my day and his day, right? Because we did this together. And so rather than me saying like, don't do that, dad, you know, like I knew because of the work ethic, because of his servant leadership style, his his just person that he is, right? To me, myself, go, could, go put on a adelantal, right? And I start serving too on my graduation. See, that is the type of leadership that we need to have. That is the type of examples of leadership that we need to be, not only for our children, but the, everybody that we come across, right? That, that we have that humility, right? But that we keep going and that we keep learning and we keep growing. So my dad did that and so much more uh, for me. Um, I became an educator, right? I, I taught my first classes in Dallas, a, a suburb of Dallas and Carrollton Farmers Branch. Our school was about 99% Latino, almost all free and reduced lunch, right? I started bringing in uh, friends from college and talking to kids about study abroad trips and, and school and sororities and, you know, conferences. And, you know, on September 16th, I have a class full of Mexican children who don't know that it's their Independence Day. And so we go outside during recess and we have a grito contest you know and so the very first grito contest was very sad it was like ay, 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 you know <laughs> but by the time we were done you know they were so proud of their heritage so proud to go home and to learn about you know Padre Hidalgo and the start of the revolution and how Mexico went into independence and so much right because we want them to be proud we want them to have that richness right that they understand that they are not only American but they are Mexican American that they can be proud of, of their culture over there and their culture over here. You know, I, I was wearing a shirt yesterday that at the top, it was a tree and it had like the American kind of flag over it, right? And at the bottom, it had roots and it had my Guatemalan flag at the bottom, you know, and because that is who we are. My roots are, are Spanish. My roots are Guatemala. My roots are, you know, I have uh, an amazing book by by Rigoberta Menchu, you know, a Nobel Peace Prize, indigenous woman from Guatemala, right? But I also have, you know, my, my Brene Brown and, uh, you know, Restorative Justice and Daring Greatly and Stamps, you know, all these books that make us who we are, right? Because we are a people that are rich and we are not trapped into being just one thing. We are uh, taking from so many different places, right? Um, so after I taught, I became an activist. I started working with uh, civil rights organizations. This was the 2006 immigration marches, right? Where we were um, millions and millions of people in the center of Dallas were advocating for immigration reform. Um, I got these like two big buses and we took, you know, I don't know, like 100 50 people from Denton uh, up to Dallas. And my dad's like, hi, Mika. You know, he's watching me with a megaphone. And before the march was over, let me just say, he was like, let me borrow that megaphone. And I'm like, oh, okay, dad. <laughs> you know, and he's out there saying, si se puede, you know, and, and all this because it's contagious, right? Um, after I taught for a few years, I got the awesome opportunity to work for the Sally May Fund, which is the nonprofit arm of Sally May. 
And we had a bus tour that went all around the country and talked to students about going to college, how to apply, how to pay for it, right? Um, a lot of these students had heard about the financial aid process before and they don't care. They don't care until you make a connection for them. So the more I started sharing my story and the more they started seeing that I was just like them, then they started learning and they started thinking, oh, maybe, maybe if she could do it, maybe I can do it too. So we did this in 35 states, 55 different cities, about 40,000 people in person, not to mention like the media, the, the TV and the radio and all of that. Um, after I finished my tour, I moved back to Texas, um, which I married my husband. He had three sons. And then we had two more daughters um, that I had. And so we raised five children together. Uh, one of them is now a United States Marine. The other one is in the army right now and about to go to South Korea. So please say a prayer for him. And then our youngest son, who is 21, my girls, Ayana and Camila. Now, I know that there's... Um, so much more that I could share. And I know that each and every single one of you also have a story, right? We all have stories. We all um, come from something. We all experience joy. We all experience pain. We all experience pride. We want to help, right? We want to connect. Um, and I think that those stories are valid. But for the students in this chat, in this uh, room today, and also you that are in the community and you're working and you're supporting, this is probably one of my favorite quotes in the whole world. It's a Cesar Chavez quote. Um, and it says, we cannot seek achievement for ourselves and forget about the progress and the prosperity of our community. Our ambitions must be broad enough to include the aspirations and the needs of others for their sake and for our own, right? It doesn't matter that I graduated from high school and college myself. What can I do to bring other people up with me? It doesn't matter that I can be a national spokesperson if what I'm talking about isn't for the benefit of others. It's just because I want to talk, right? That's the prayer is that, I, that I'm going somewhere where I'm going to say the things that people need to hear and not so much the things I want to say, right? Um, that people feel empowered to work and to, and to be with each other and to help. Now, this is my dad. I'll tell you really quick. My dad um, had his third DWI when I was 12 years old. He was about to go to jail for a long, long time. And by the grace of God, um, and I talked to the judge and I, he asked me all these questions. They allowed him to have 10 years of probation. But at that last wreck that he had, that last, last DWI, he woke up in a sobering tank in jail and he said no more. And he stopped drinking cold turkey from one day to the other. And he said he gave his life back to God. Um, he remarried. He had two more sons um, that they both graduated from high school. They're both in college right now. Um, and then this is last year about, yeah, I think last year he became a U.S. citizen after about 50 years in this country, uh, about 40 years in this country. And so uh, he called me up and he was like, I did it. Like, he's like, ask me, ask me about the 13 colonies. And I'm like, no, dad, I don't want to ask you about the 13 colonies, you know, <laughs> but he passed his test with flying colors and he called me and he said, I'm a gringo now, you know, and I'm like, okay. You know, he was so happy. Now, my daughter um, that I started opening this talk about, you know, um, I want her to grow up and to care about other people, right? I want her to be kind and to have empathy and have tolerance and love people, right? Um, when she was about 10 years old, um, she went and gave a testimony in front of the city council here when we were trying to pass an ordinance, a non-discrimination ordinance, I believe, here in town. Um, she was very brave. She did it. Now, I don't know that she will go on and be, you know, an activist or anything like that. But I hope that just by the example that I set, that, that the most important thing is not only all the things that you can achieve, but like I said, all the things that we can help, you know, and that we can achieve together. Like you guys said, inclusivity for a stronger nation, right? Uh, recognition, giving credit where credit is due, helping each other, joining movements together and helping and working together for the benefit of all people. So I thank you. You guys have been an awesome audience and thank you for allowing me just to share, you know, parts of my story and my history with you guys. Um, and I'm going to open it up back to Ms. Velasquez and see if you guys have any questions, but um, just thank you for, for being here. Thank you for taking time out of your day. I know that most of you guys are at work. I can see um, y'all probably have so many things to do. And so I just thank you for taking time to celebrate with us, you know, um, just a small celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month. Lillian, thank you. Thank you so much. And yes, the questions are rolling in. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Your story is amazing. Thank you. We have several TRIO staff and alumni on the call. Yay. What advice do you give to all student-facing staff 
when working with first generation low income students? Well, I mean, I think um, I think the the advice that I can give, right, is you you need to um, or we all have to um, really listen right to the students. We have to be the people that um, we can't push and we can't force trust, but we have to build that trust with the, with the students. Right. Because right now they're looking at you like, what are you going to do? And if I really tell you what's happening, if I really tell you the insecurities that I have, and maybe I shouldn't even really be in school, you know, maybe, maybe I'm not even college material. Like I said, that imposter syndrome is really bad, you know, when you're the first um, to go to school. Um, your students are also, you know, and I'm sure you probably already know, are also dealing with guilt, you know, that guilt whenever I got my scholarship and I decided to go to school full time when I got the, to go to the university, the one thing that was going to keep me from doing that was the guilt because I had been paying bills at my house. So now if I'm in school full time, who's going to pay the bills? Can my dad do it? Am, is it going to be a burden? Am I turning my back on my dad? When I worked for Sally May Fund, there was so, we gave a scholarship after every evening presentation that we did. And more than once I had students that gave the scholarship back to me. It was a thousand dollars towards any school that they ever wanted to go when they were ready to go. And they said, no, I'm not going to use it. I said, why? They said, because I have to help my mom. Like I can't be in school. Like I got to work. I got to help my mom. I got to help, you know, you know, maintain the home and all this stuff. And, and uh, so it was just really difficult, you know, to get students out of that, to say, Hey, let's, let's stop. Let's just think like that immediate gratification, your parents will pull through. They are resourceful. Right. Um, but if you sacrifice for a year, a year and a half, like what more could you do? Right. Um, and just really just listening to them, meeting them where they're at, being patient, right? It doesn't mean lowering standards. You can be a, what is it, a, a, a warm demander, right? Where, where you love on them and you know and you understand and I acknowledge it is hard, right? It's hard to go into that class. It's hard to be the only Latino maybe in that school or, or to be the only person, you know, that's Afri African-American and Black student in, in a class. It is hard, right? It's hard to, to be a, a white student of low resources and go into a classroom and feel like you're the only one that doesn't understand the vocabulary that they're using because you came from a school that was low performing and you don't have that base, right? But the thing is that things come and it's little by little. They, students look and they see the finished product. Um, I taught middle school for one year. That was enough. And all my kids, I would tell them, don't you want to go to college? Don't you want to go to school? Don't you want to graduate high school? And they would all look at me and they're like, oh, miss, like, you're just lucky. You're lucky because you're naturally smart. You're lucky because, you know, you can do that, right? Uh, I don't, we don't, I don't know English that well. I don't have papers. My dad did it, da, 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 right? And so when they knew more about me, they were like, oh, like, I didn't know all that, right? But students will just see like, oh, you got the degree, you got the office, you, you know, they think that you haven't lived what they've, what they're going through. And so I would sit there and I'll be very vulnerable and transparent. That's another thing that I would encourage you that if you are okay with sharing parts of your story, that you share those stories with them. Um, you know, the, when I was getting my master's degree, I was doing homework on the bathroom floor in my room because my, I had just had a newborn, my husband's going to work, I didn't want to wake him up, but I had to finish school, it requires sacrifice, right, um, but the more you share of your stories, the more they're going to see, like, oh, like, maybe they do understand, you know, I, in my office at school, I work in an elementary school right now, full-time, and I have a picture, many of the pictures that I showed y'all, I have those printed out in my office, and, and kids are like, that's your dad, and I'm like, yeah, that's my dad. And, you know, me, you know, with my crazy hair, you know, when I was a kid that my dad cut my bangs. And so I'm like this, right. So that they see it's not the finished product. This is how I grew up. Right. Um, and so being vulnerable, being transparent, if you want your students to go there and to trust you, you have to trust them with parts of your story. Don't lower the expectation. But then also, you know, it's not the end of the world. If they fail a class, you can come back. Uh, it might take more you know, if you're on academic probation, you're on SAT, you don't meet satisfactory academic progress, it might take you, you know, sit out a semester, save a thousand bucks, pay for one class, and then come back in good standing. It's not the end, right? They're going to keep going. They can keep going. Uh, and they just need to know that someone believes in them. I am so thankful that I had so many people that believed in me and saw more in myself than I did in, my, in, in me, even now, even till today. 
I still have people that they're like, oh, you should do this. And I'm like, no, I can't. No. You know, and they're like, yeah, you can. And I'm like, no. And or, or can I? Maybe? Could I? Right. Really? Right. And so we just keep doing that for them for them. Okay. Um, I'm gonna interspear some questions in here so that more people get an opportunity, but I'll go back to some others related to college. Um, I never took the college route. Is there anything out there we can do for our people in the trade? I have succeeded, but others may not. We need our people involved in professional trades. Yeah, um, you know, with LULAC here in town, I do a lot of work and we give out scholarships. Normally, the national office, if you have a LULAC chapter, and LULAC is all over the country, right? Um, they, if they submit, like a local chapter will raise money and they submit it to the national office. The national office will match the local scholarship at 50%. So if I, if we get $18,000, they'll give us 18 plus another 9,000, right? That money is tied to go towards like a community college or a university. So what we did is we started asking for donations for scholarships specifically to trade schools, right? Um, so that we are out there and we're promoting this to our students because trade schools are, are great, but sometimes they're super expensive. You know, they're, they are expensive. Um, and so some of the students will just not even say, you know, I can't do it because I don't have that much money to buy the equipment to be a welder or, you know, to go to like an ITT technical school and things like that. But I would say, you know, if you're involved with an organization, if you guys can raise money, if you can go out there to like the, the 11th and 12th graders and even earlier and just start saying, hey, this is the potential earning opportunity for people that are, you know, doing this type of school. Um, my my a lot of the students that I talk to a lot of the young girls will say I want to do cosmetology and I'm like yeah that's great like our schools in the area where I work and a lot of schools they will offer that as a certificate while they're still in high school right so if they get that while they're still in high school then that's great but then I'll tell the young lady hey that would be really awesome and then you can be a cosmetologist for like the rest of high school and the first few years of junior college. But then you could like major in like, I don't know, biology or science kind of science and you could develop your own like skincare line. And then, you know, you can get an MBA and get a master's degree and, and open up your own business. And then you'll have like two and three and four salons, right? One of the things that I know, uh, and this is going off a little bit of what you're, what you're asking me, but I think it's important to say students that come from families with low resources, right? We are taught to think in terms of money. If you asked me when I was a kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a doctor. I hate science. I'm not good at it, right? Um, but I want to be a doctor because they make a lot of money, right? But there is no intrinsic motivation in me to do that. It's all ex extrinsic. It's all something that I can get, right? There was a study that was done that if you ask a child from low resources, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they say, I want to be a doctor. Why? Because they make a lot of money. It's probably not going to happen. There, it, there's no intrinsic motivation for them to follow that. But if you ask a child coming from an affluent home and they say, I want to be a doctor. And then you ask them, why do you want to be a doctor? Uh, because I want to discover the cure for cancer and I want to do stem cell research and I want to do this. And I went to a camp that they talked about this and this and this. That is intrinsic you know, motivation. That is their own curiosity. There is more chances that that child is going to pursue that, right? And, and actually apply it and have it, right? Versus us when we're, all we're thinking is it, that immediate money, right? And so we, we have to allow children to dream and to think big, right? So along the lines of what you're saying with trades and, and different opportunities, the workforce, give them a pathway, right? Uh, plan it out for them, help them apply, help them get money to like be able to pay for those schools so that they can continue their education, um, even if it's not the traditional route, right? But just allowing them to kind of have those opportunities and meet um, business owners that are doing well, right? So whoever asked the question, you said you didn't have the traditional route of going to college, but you're doing great. You know, you have a, probably have a business, you're doing good monetarily, go out there, share your testimony with students, talk to them, let them know that those opportunities are available. All right, we're gonna finish up with a couple questions here. I'll let you decide how much to give on both of them, Lillian. How did you combat your imposter syndrome, one? And number two, what strategies do you suggest for us who believe in sharing historical cultural knowledge but face obstacles due to public concern about critical race theory? 
Okay. I want you to repeat the second one. Um, cause I have the answer for the first, but I want to make sure that I'm, I'm listening to the second one. Um, the second is what strategies strategies do you suggest for us who believe in sharing historical cultural knowledge, but face obstacles due to the public opinion on critical race theory? Yeah. Okay, so let me start with the first one because that one's easier. So I think the very, I still struggle with the imposter syndrome. Um, I read a lot about it. I try to do a lot of research about it. Um, I, I know that about 70% of the population struggles with the imposter syndrome in one space or another right? Um, so just because I have it in one area doesn't mean I have it in another, right? Um, but I think the thing that helped me the most is number one, acknowledging and knowing what it is, naming it, that that is what it is, right? Um, and, and I can laugh about some things now, um, but there are still spaces now, you know, as a 42-year-old with a master's degree and, and you know, I do these speeches and things like that, that I'm still going and I'm like, I don't feel like I belong, right? I feel like I am pretending, you know, that I'm, I'm supposed to be there when I'm really not. So um, one of the things, like I said, it's acknowledging and knowing what it is. And then number two is whenever I am in those spaces, I need to challenge myself and to ask myself, am I exhibiting or am I having a fixed mindset or a growth mindset right now, right? So if I am in a, in a room, <clears throat> I'll give you an example. Uh, I was part of a leadership, you know, every chamber of commerce in every city has like a leadership program. So I was in a uh, leadership Denton here where I live and I was the only person that was an educator. Everybody else were either lawyers or bankers or real estate agents. They were all predominantly white, all predominantly male uh, and all predominantly older than I was. Right. And so I, I didn't feel like I had anything contri to contribute. I didn't feel like I had anything, you know, that they were going to learn from or they would dismiss me because just of who I was. Right. Um, and then most of the time when we were talking about economic development in our community and all these other things that I am not an expert expert at, I just would like shrink. I'd start feeling smaller and smaller and smaller, right? But the program that we were in, it, it talked about economic development, that it also had a day on education, and then also had a, a day on activism, and then also had, you know, and so the further we got in those days, I'm like, oh, I, I know about education, right? And so then I would start sharing my knowledge, right? And so realizing what it is, but then realizing that we do not have to be experts at everything, right? We, we have an expertise in certain things that we can contribute and having a growth mindset, I'm going to go into those settings and I'm going to learn from those people and not be threatened by what I don't know, right? A person with a fixed mindset is going to go into those rooms and say, mm, I don't know, I don't know anything about what they're talking about. So I'm just going to, I'm going to bounce, I'm going to leave, right? And then you negate yourself the opportunity to learn. So for me, it was naming it. It was, uh, you know, examining, am I having a growth or a fixed mindset by this? It's giving myself grace and knowing that I don't have to be an expert at everything, right? And allowing myself just to really learn, uh, you know, about the things that I don't know, right? And and being okay with that. Like, uh, thinking a, a person that struggles with imposter syndrome, they feel like they have to know something about every single thing, and that's just not possible. So I think those probably four steps are probably the things that have helped me the most, with that, right? With that, um, and, and really just, you know, listening to other people as they share. And I'm like, no way, like you, you go, you, you go through that as well. Um, that has also helped as well. Uh, having people to talk to. Um, okay. The question about critical race theory, that is really hard, right? And so um, as a speaker and as a national speaker, there have been states where I go and they will make me sign a contract that says, uh, I will not say anything that will make people of a certain race feel bad for things that have happened in the past. Like that's how real it has gotten there. They, you know, and I tell them, are you sure that you want me as a speaker? Because my whole life is, you know, could be classified as cr critical race theory. Right. Um, and so I think that that's really hard. I think that's a question that you have to answer on how far you're able to, push that, you know, without it being something that comes back to you. Um, I read a lot. And so I necessarily won't tell students, you know, what to think. I'll just tell them, hey, there's a really good book that I would recommend, you know, this probably being one of them, a different mirror 
uh, and they have the youth version of this, you know, so that it's not so wordy and not so thick uh, for our young people, uh, but just kind of point them in the directions where they're able to ask the questions that they want to ask. Um, in a classroom setting, I think that's really hard. So the only way that I'm able to do that is, you know, I, uh, we have like outside workshops that we do. So I, I'm not doing it while I have a, a educator hat on. I'm doing it when I have like my uh, community activism hat on because it is really tricky. I think Texas is a super conservative state um, and there's things trickling down our pipeline that are even scary for me as an educator. Uh, things like cataloging every single book that we have in our offices and in our classrooms, you know, and getting in trouble for having books that, you know, some parents think their kids shouldn't have access to. And, you know, it's just the reality of what, where we're at. Um, but I think we all kind of need to be aware of what's happening at the state legislature in whatever state we're at, what kind of propositions are happening, what kind of laws are, are happening, um, you know, and then either vote, you know, or run <laughs> or encourage someone else to run, you know, that can kind of represent the things that you want um, available, you know, to your students. But um, and then the last thing is really just I'm trying to educate my own kids, right? Um, to make sure that they grow up as critical thinkers and not just someone that is going to listen and is going to hear and believe only what they're being told. You know, I, I really want our students to be just critical thinkers. You know, I think that that's probably the biggest hurdle right now for our students and um, education in, in the U.S. I don't know if that answered your question. I think it's a really hard question because it's how much of your neck do you want to stick out there, you know, and what's it what's it really worth to you to be able to talk about the reality, um, you know, versus what we are being told to teach. Um, so it's kind of like a roundabout, but I know that's really like loaded topic. It's like, I even have to like think like, how can I tell you? Cause I don't want to say something that might get you in trouble and you're not willing to assume that responsibility, you know? Thank you. We appreciate your your knowledge, your your understanding of the world that educators live in. And mm -hmm. thank you so much for, for that, Lillian. I did promise you I'd give you a chance to share a final message. If you have one that you'd like to share, we can do that now. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, um, you know, I think my my biggest thing, hopefully that you got out of this is that, you know, I, I wanted to share my story so that you know where I'm coming from, right? And you know the passion of why I feel like we need to keep working and providing opportunities for students of all backgrounds, right? Uh, but per particularly, <clears throat> particularly <clears throat> uh, for students who have come from underrepresented populations and uh, more uh, <clears throat> oppressed groups, I guess, if I can say that, um, you know, but I, I think that we, if we are... Um, if we are genuine and transparent, right? Um, and we share parts of us, right? Um, <coughs> with many of these students, I think that they'll be really receptive. <coughs> I don't know if you guys have ever read this book, but it's called Barking to the Choir. It's a really good book if you guys have it uh, by Father Gregory Boyle, but he talks about, <coughs> you know, we, we always, um, are around like-minded people, right? And then we wonder why we don't change the minds of other people. Well, because we're always, it's like singing to the choir and barking up the wrong tree. It's kind of a combination of those two. We always want to talk, you know, to people who aren't necessarily the people that need to hear. So sometimes with my story, like I want to talk to that um, politician that says, go back to your country because I want to share a little bit of the history, right? Like Brene Brown said, it's hard to hate. It's easy to hate people far away, hard to hate them when they're up close. So the more open, transparent, building bridges, that kind of minded, you know, mindedness that we can be, I think the better we all will be together in the long run. So I appreciate Metropolitan Co uh, Community College just for you guys having me here, uh, for allowing me to share this story and just for the message of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, inclusivity for a stronger nation. So thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. Um, you've given us so much to think about and reflect on, relate to, better understand students. We're very, very thankful. Audience, thank you for joining us. Almost everybody stuck through this. I know some of you had to go on to other meetings or classes, so it's been great. Uh, Isaac, could you please put up our evaluation. This uh, link is also in the chat. 
We really appreciate your feedback. And remember, if you attend and complete evaluations, including your contact information in 20 of our programs this year, you will be recognized and there'll be a lot of fun for us. Um, I put my info in the chat if anybody needs to reach out, but thank you guys so much. Okay, and I will add that to an email send to everybody so that you've got that. Thank you, Lillian. Bye-bye.